Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Thank you so much for choosing to spend a little time with us viewing our Thursday night Bible study. And I pray that you will receive something that will prepare you for your journey in the future. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll correct, enlighten, and empower our hearts and minds to be more than just hearers of your word, but move us to become consistent doers of your word and teach us to live right to enjoy your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our study tonight is uh, the, the base scripture is Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, I'm reading the English Standard Version, and it reads, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. For the last few weeks, we've studied about praying right, thinking right, and this week, living right for God's peace. If you want to enjoy the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, you got to learn how to, to pray right, to think right, and to live right. You cannot separate outward actions and inward attitude. They go together. And sin always results in unrest unless the conscience is seared. And then it doesn't, sinning doesn't bother you. And purity ought to result in peace. When we live right, that ought to result in peace. Peace of heart, peace of mind, and peace with your environment, the people around you. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17, and I'm reading the message version. It reads, and where there is right, which is truth, there will be peace and the progeny which is offspring of right, the offspring of right uh, will, will result in quiet lives and endless trust in Jesus. Now, James chapter three, verse 17 says, but the wisdom that is from above is pure, then peaceable. Right living is a necessary condition for experiencing the peace of God. Paul balances four activities, learned, received, heard, and seen. It is one thing to learn a truth, but something else to receive it inwardly and make it a part of our inner person. When we hear the truth of God and receive it on the, on the uh, inside or in our spirit, the next step is to live it daily. It's like learning a definition of a word from the dictionary. After you learn it, then you start to use it correctly because you know the correct meaning and the use of the word. Now, you must also trust the source of the dictionary, uh, whether it's Webster or Nelson Bible Dictionary, Eastman Smith Bible Dictionary, or some other trustworthy diction dictionary. Uh, you have to trust your source. Now, that's the way we are to respond to hearing and receiving God's biblical word. We trust the source. The Bible is God's breathed word, the Logos. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17 says that the man of God, and that includes all of us, man, woman, boys and girls, mankind in essence, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, and this is the King James Version, it says, for this cause, also thank we God without ceasing because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us or from us, uh, you received it not as the word of men, but as the 
as, as it were, the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And then the message version of that same uh, verse, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says, and now we look back on it all and thank God and are teasing well of thanks. In other words, it's continually flowing. I'm continually thanking God. And I personally continually thank God for Mount Sinai. When you got the message of God that I preached or we preached, you didn't pass it off as just one more human opinion. But you took it as to heart, as God's true word to you, which it is. God himself at work in you believers. God gives us his word for the purpose of working in us to produce fruit. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 10 says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it. Facts in the head are not enough. We must also have truth in our hearts. In Paul's ministry, he did not he not only taught the word, but he also lived it so that his listeners could see the truth in his life. What he was teaching, he was living, and it had a profound effect on his life. You, when you read the life of Paul, you cannot but admit that God's word, after he met Jesus, the word of God that was made flesh on the Damascus road, his life, he made a radical change in the way that he lived. Now, Paul's experience ought to be our experience. We must learn the word, receive it, hear it, and do it. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, as said in James chapter 1, verse 22. The peace of God is one test of whether or not we are in the will of God. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, the Living Bible version says, Let the peace of heart that comes from Christ be always present in your heart and live for this, in lives rather, for this is your responsibility and privilege as members of his body. And always be thankful. If we are walking with the Lord, then the peace of God and the God of peace exercises their influence over our heart. Whenever we disobey, we lose that peace and we know we have done something wrong. That's a conscious aspect of God's peace working that out in our lives. A disciple of Jesus recognizes when we've done something wrong. It bothers us. We are uneasy. We lose the joy of God's salvation. We become like Peter when he warmed his hands by or himself by the enemy's fire. Jesus told him that he would deny him three times. And on the third time, Peter realized his wrong and he went out and cried bitterly. God's peace is the umpire that calls us out when we've done wrong or disobeyed him. Right praying, right thinking, and right living. These are the conditions for having the secure mind and victory over worry. As Philippians chapter four uh, is the peace chapter of the New Testament, James chapter four is the war chapter, and first Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. Now James chapter four begins with a question. From whence come wars and fighting among you? James explains that the cause of war uh, was wrong praying. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss. That's James 4 and 3. And then also wrong thinking. 
He says, purify your heart, you double minded. That's James chapter four, verse eight. And then wrong living. He says, ye, you, he says, know ye that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. That's James chapter four, verse four. There's no middle ground. Either you yield heart and mind to the spirit of God and practice right praying, right thinking, right living, or we yield to the flesh and find ourselves torn apart by worry. There is no need to worry. And worry uh, is a sin. Uh, before uh, the coronavirus started, uh, I was going for about two years or more. I was going through uh, things that uh, uh, we have changed from being sin to respectable sin. We, we dumb it down what really is sin. And there's a lot of sin more than uh, what we do and don't. And that's found in the Ten Commandments. Worrying is a sin. And you can read that in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 through uh, 34. If you're going to worry, then don't pray. But if you're going to pray, then you should not worry. And don't lose sleep worrying about things since God will be awake and watching over us. Psalms 121 verse 1 says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And he clarifies that his help is not so much coming from the hill, but he says in verse two, my help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel or the church shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand, and the sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from, uh, uh, from this time forth and even forevermore. With the peace of God to guard us, and the God of peace to guide us. Why do we have to worry? John chapter 14, verse 27 says, peace, and this is Jesus talking to his disciples. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid but rest in the peace of God. Jesus has secured our peace with God and he's, he is our peace now and forever. If we follow the roadmap of peace that Jesus gave us, then we can walk in peace with everyone. The peace that Jesus purchased with his blood on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, he did die in our place and therefore, we should not worry about death or the grave. The grave is now a thoroughfare. This, from this life of trouble to the life where troubles will cease. Jesus also rose from the dead to remind us that he has carried our sins away from us as our scapegoat. Because of that, we know that not only do we have peace with God, but also peace, the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Well, that's all I've got for you this week. And come back next week and pray that God will provide more. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your peace that exceeds our ability to comprehend it. And since peace goes well with joy, thank you for the joy that's unspeakable. And we ask that you would give the increase to what we've heard for the purpose that we can live right. And in the name that brings us peace in our darkest hour, 
Jesus Christ, your son, our savior, we pray. Amen. Well, uh, you know, know the, the, the story. Uh, in the days to come, wear your mask. Mask up. And practice safe distancing. And also practice a good hygiene of washing your hands. And today is the first day of early voting. What are you going to do? Just as I'm about to do. I'm going to vote. My wife and I, we are going to vote. That's the next thing on our list. So go vote. And if you don't make it during the easy time of voting, which is uh, early voting, when the, long, the, when the lines are not long, then be prepared to, to, to be patient. Practice patient with, if the lines are long on November 3rd. But sometime between now and November 3rd, go vote. Go vote. Go vote. And the God of peace will be with you. So long.